just briefly on the uh, on the green belt question, we uh, we've asked that to to a lot of our um, stakeholders um, as well as uh, you, and it's always a very uh, <laughs> a question that is quite divisive, um, w w w which means that our transport strategy, where we're um, attempting to drive the uh, initiative of um, kind of transport driven development and actually accommodating the large amount of developments that is uh, forecast to be delivered in the southeast um, means that we need to make a very strong case to, um, to all key stakeholders um, uh, involved in the process. Um, so very useful to get your input on that. Um, I'm Edmund Cassidy, I'm project manager on the development of the transport strategy and um, my plan for the next probably half hour is to um, take you through, um, firstly, the, um, the, the, the early work that we undertook um, with Transport for the South East in setting out the uh, strategic and economic rationale for um, the kind of Transport for the South East as, a, 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 as an initiative. I'll then um, move on to um, showing some of the um, initial analysis and findings that we have um, that we've put together as part of the transport strategy development and then um, a, a, a brief section on um, next steps, um, how, how we're going to move from these initial analytical and um, presentational outputs to developing that wider um, transport strategy. So to start on the economic connectivity review, which was a, um, a piece of work which we undertook um, last year. Um, it, uh, it had the aim to, uh, to take a strategic view um, and identify the economic priorities um, in the transport for the southeast area. We were trying to make the case for um, investment in the area and also to um, develop the evidence base to um, kind of set a really good foundation on which this transport strategy um, could be built. Um, there was also a, a requirement to have a kind of very compelling visual um, uh, do, p p p piece of uh, or the documentation which could be used to um, kind of raise the profile of transport for the southeast as an area with kind of MPs, key stakeholders, um, uh, and hopefully that was what we um, what we developed. Um, it was not to uh, to develop a uh, program of transport schemes, and actually as part of the transport strategy, we're um, we're looking more areas of, of intervention. Um, rather than actually transport schemes at this stage. This graphic um, identifies the kind of key findings which we got to as part of the Economic Connectivity Review. Um, at the top of the infographic are what we identified as the economic outcomes of um, improved transport connectivity. So these are um, improving um, business to business connectivity, uh, expanding the workforce through labour market efficiency improvements, enabling uh, the large scale of, tra of uh, housing and commercial development um, which is planned in the southeast to come forward, accessing the international gateways and supporting deprived communities within um, the transport for the southeast area. Um, so first up, we identified that there were 7.5 million people in the, in the southeast with 4 million jobs and 0.3 million businesses. As Rupert has already uh, alluded to, we, um, currently the economy of the, of the transport for the southeast area is um, worth 200 billion GVA per annum, and this is forecast to grow. Although that growth alone requires high levels of uh, transport and other investment to ensure that the kind of the current projections are continued. Through um, assessment of uh, the but both the priority industries of the uh, kind of LEPs and local authorities in the area, as well as identification of industries which are particularly strong, where there are kind of concentrations of activities within geographical areas. We came, um, came to conclusions about what the high growth sectors of the Transport for the Southeast area are. Um, so these high growth sectors are um, financial and professional services, IT services, advanced engineering and manufacturing, creative, creative uh, sectors, low carbon environmental, uh, marine, maritime and defence, transport and logistics and tourism. And these 
high growth sectors are supported by business support services, construction, <laughs> education, health and retail. And with the, um, the, 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 the necessary and required investment in infrastructure um, to support these um, high growth sectors and the enabling sectors, we could potentially be looking at, um, by 2050, an economy worth 500 billion with 6.8 million jobs, a, a, a significant increase on, um, on the, the, the current projections. So if we, if we move on from that, we, we're looking at what the key uh, kind of unique selling points of the, uh, the transport for the southeast area are. And key to the success of the transport for the southeast area is its international gateways, which uh, both which support both UK trade and also um, the, the, the tourism sector. Um, and it's often said that uh, the international gateways of the South East are the international gateways of the UK. The West Midlands sends a huge amount of its uh, uh, kind of uh, automotive exports through Southampton. Dover is, uh, is, is responsible for um, I think 85% of, um, of all um, exports to the EU. And clearly Heathrow and Gatwick are, um, are key international gateways for supporting businesses and, um, and the people of, trans of transport for the South East area and the wider UK. Um, there are currently 0.8 million homes planned within the kind of local plan period, but it's expected that this is only half of what could be realised by 2050. And the transport network of the South East is, is key for delivering this, um, this development without improvements on the um, <coughs> strategic road network and the rail network. These, th these homes won't be, won't be able to come forward. Um, as, uh, w w we also undertook some transport analysis which indicated that a one-minute journey time saving on these key, on the key corridors which we identified could lead to a, um, in a, a, a an uplift of um, 4.5 million pounds to the economy. And so, I think the conclusion of um, the economic connectivity review was that um, in order to drive economic growth in a sustainable way, these key corridors need to be supported. Um, to support a wider buoyant economy for the UK. With, with this map, um, we identify the specific um, economic impacts of transport which are particularly supported by each of the corridors. So um, we see that uh, kind of the key radial routes such as the um, M4 Great Western Main Line and the M3 South Western Main Line um, support uh, a wide variety of economic impacts, including um, business to business connectivity, um, given the uh, kind of concentrations of um, uh, high value sectors within that corridor um, needing interaction with London and uh, along that corridor um, uh, to ensure they remain um, uh, successful as possible. Um, I think that this is, uh, this is a map which. Uh, which can be found in the Economic Connectivity Review and um, uh, probably easier to uh, analyse it on there. Um, so on to uh, the transport strategy development. So we have an 18-month programme um, for delivery, um, starting off with inception and mobilisation and then moving on to the strategic and economic context where we're looking at... Um, uh, the, the, the ways in which the um, strategic vision and principles set out um, in, uh, by, by Transport for the South East are in line with national, regional and local um, uh, policy context. We've also um, looked into the relationship between the South East and London and uh, potential impacts of Brexit, although um, when I discuss that in a moment there will be lots of uh, conditionals in, uh, in, in what I'm saying. Um, Moving on to the strategic corridors, this, the, the, this section is kind of building on the work within the um, Economic Connectivity Review, um, where we are um, looking to enhance the evidence base which sits behind um, the way in which we've assessed the importance of those corridors. Next, on to uh, transport assessment. Um, 
Mark referred um, briefly to the future demand forecasting. Um, this is quite an innovative way of um, looking at uh, looking at the, di the different economic levers, which could um, which could mean that uh, different types of transport investment um, could have different outputs um, in the future. And we're, we're trying to ensure that the transport strategy is um, resilient to those different potential futures. Um, transport investment section, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll move towards putting together a five-year investment plan. And then finally, we will um, uh, draft the transport strategy and go out to public consultation in uh, Q3 of 2019-20. Uh, um, so the first piece of work that we've undertaken is, is looking at the strategic context. We've reviewed policy and strategy documents, looked at the alignment of that with, the T with TFSE's vision and strategic pr principles, and then considered this and how the, uh, and the implications that, that has on the um, or, or on how we develop the transport strategy. Um, looking at planning, spatial, um, transport, environmental, social, and economic policy documents at a, at a national, regional, and local level. So what, what we found from this was, um, in, a, in a broad way, we're, we're, we're still seeing the kind of triple lock of sustainability. So um, sustainable economic growth, um, uh, a, a sustainable approach to uh, driving improved <laughs> social inclusion, and then um, protecting and enhancing the natural and historic environment. But we did notice that there is, that there is, a, uh, that there is some shift in, um, in policy over the last kind of five years towards much more um, importance on placemaking and um, driving housing development, housing and commercial development through um, uh, transport investment, which I think is, um, is reflective of, the, uh, the of TFSE's um, strategic priorities. There's also um, much more consideration of um, the importance of social inclusion and the way in which transport can um, link communities together, um, improve access to um, skills and employment. And then the, 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 imp the importance of environmental net gain is coming through a lot of the, pol uh, of the current um, uh, policy documents. We then, we, we, we've also undertaken um, uh, a kind of study topic paper on um, the relationship between the South East and London. I think this was partly driven by um, the idea that there is a kind of thought that L London is, is effectively supported by the South East, but actually the South East's the South East entire job market is London. And actually I think that that, that, that needed more scrutiny because um, uh, can, can, can it really be that, 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 that such a large population is, is reliant on um, the job market in London? Through our, through our analysis of both um, the, uh, the current situation in terms of um, transport demand between the South East and London, um, evidence of the future situation, so looking at future kind of crowding and capacity constraints on the transport network, and then also the kind of policy which is, which is being put forward from um, the South East and from London and the way in which that could drive changes in um, transport demand between the South East and London. Um, we, we sought to, uh, to, uh, to identify um, whether there was a, well, well, the, the kind of nuance behind that, that headline. And what we found was that actually 84% of commuter trips from the TFSE area remain within the TFSE area. So, 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 so it's not the case that kind of every morning Every single person in the southeast gets up, gets on the train, and goes straight into uh, into London. Actually, it's it, it's a ve it's a very self-sufficient area. Thirteen percent of commuter trips do go into London, and three percent go to other regions. Um, on the, th this map shows um, the commuting from transport for the southeast to Greater London, and uh, and it shows that there is a very significant band around the, um, the, the border with Greater London, which, um, to, from which there is very, very high levels of commuting into London. Um, and that's 44% commuting by car, 47% by rail. 
Um, but when, when, when you look at a map that um, is pointing towards central London, actually that rail number goes up to 90%. And what, what this indicates is that actually a, a large proportion of these commutes from the area bordering Greater London are actually kind of hopping over from Dartford to Bromley or, uh, or uh, other areas around the M25. Um, and I think the, 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 the implications that that has um, on the transport strategy are that um, there are lot, the, the, the southeast is a, um, is a multi-centric, po polycentric area. And um, each of these areas have their own labor, labor market. And actually supporting transport within those labor markets um, may be one way in which uh, the any reliance that there is on London can be um, reduced. Uh, we've zoomed in on a, um, on a network rail crowding map, identifying the, um, the, the, the point on the southeast rail network at which passengers have to start standing on their way into um, London. This is the 2026 forecast, and it identifies that um, there are some areas within the, within the transport of the southeast area generally quite close to London where standing is required. There's particular, um, particularly high levels of demand coming from Basingstoke where we know that um, there is high levels of development forecast. The Great Western Main Line and the South Western Main Line are the areas where the highest levels of crowding um, and particularly growth in crowding are forecast. And then this is the road network by 2041. And as, as it says, on the arterial roads with no intervention, it's forecast that um, there will be no capacity um, for growth in demand. Um, one thing to note is that um, in, the, in the current situation there, or, or on the A20 and M20 and A2, M2, there's quite a lot of um, capacity available there. And this, this forecast to 2041 indicates that the high levels of um, planned development there are filling up the roads. <coughs> so on to the uh, impacts of Brexit. Um, so to, to, to delve into this uh, quite thorny issue, we firstly looked at the, um, the current policy context, um, and the, which is obviously a, a moving feast at the moment. Um, we also focus particularly on the impact on the international gateways, for, for, for obvious reasons. Um, Do 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 Dover is expected to, um, to be significantly constrained if uh, border arrangements are um, changed in a, in, in a disadvantageous way. Um, and uh, we, we, we expect that to, um, uh, well, we'll get more certainty on that uh, at some point, I'm sure. Um, we then looked at um, uh, the, 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 different, the different scenarios that there could be, the kind of um, a withdrawal agreement, no Brexit, soft Brexit, Norway plus, and a no deal scenario, and uh, assessed um, different, d d different aspects of, um, of, of, of what could happen in the next, um, next couple of years, depending on the different scenario which we come out with. In terms of direct transport impacts, uh, we expect the A2, M2 and the A20, M20 corridors um, to, uh, to feel quite significant levels of um, change as a result of um, changing uh, border arrangements at Dover. Um, we also expect that uh, passenger travel trends uh, may be impacted due to changes in the cost of travel and um, uh, changes to barriers to travel. In terms of the indirect economic impacts of um, Brexit, again, um, lots of conditionals in what I'm saying, but um, we expect that uh, the, the, the industrial sectors, which rely, which rely particularly on the trade and supply chain operations with EU partners, um, and which are priorities for the transport for the southeast area, could be negatively impacted. Um, sectors such as advanced engineering and manufacturing, transport and logistics, low carbon environmental and marine maritime and defence. Um, the increased travel times uh, may have a negative impact on the, um, on the number of international tourists coming, but it may boost domestic tourism. Um, 
And then we expect that um, due to reduced competition from, uh, um, from uh, EU citizens working in the UK, um, there may be more jobs available, but similarly, uh, the potential general downward trend in the, in the economy may reduce um, those job opportunities. So on to our um, scenario development work, which the purpose of this work is to um, identify in a, in a very uncertain future different scenarios, some, some which, um, which look at kind of uh, the, 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 the rise of, uh, the, of future mobility technology, some that consider um, housing growth, um, some, that, some that may consider uh, working practice preferences. And um, we kind of build, build up a narrative around each of these scenarios um, and then quantify those scenarios and use them within, a, uh, within a, a, an economic model to understand the ways in which um, those different scenarios will have an impact on the, uh, the growth and jobs in the economy and look at how transport can both um, deliver those scenarios and also support those scenarios but be resilient to those scenarios. I think that we're not suggesting that any of these scenarios are more deliverable, more feasible, more realistic or more desirable. It's just understanding what the potential futures are and making sure that um, the transport strategy is resilient to these different scenarios. So through stakeholder engagement, we identified um, four different dimensions of interest. The economy and employment, health and environment, technology and transport policy. And through um, kind of tweaking with the levers within those different dimensions, we put together four different scenarios. The London hub is a scenario um, in which it's kind of a, a business as usual um, 2.0. So um, the, the, the importance of arterial routes into London and investment on those routes continues to be the priority. This results in increased commuting to, uh, to London, um, increased kind of... Um, economic growth within London and increased support of the south, from the southeast to London. The next um, a scenario is on the sustainable futures. This is um, putting that uh, social inclusion and environmental net gain at the, at the centre of, uh, uh, of everything that we're targeting. So this could include stuff like in, uh, high levels of um, road pricing investment in active modes and sustainable transport. The, uh, the scenario on digital futures shows the southeast being at the forefront of um, driving technology um, as, uh, as part of all of our transport solutions, looking at connected, connected autonomous vehicles in our, in our local centres and, um, and demand responsive um, routes within our more rural areas. And then finally, there is a scenario, um, which we're still trying to work out what the name of it is, um, but this is a scenario which is particularly concentrated at um, uh, emphasising the, um, the, the, the priorities and strengths of the South East. So looking at those, um, those industrial sectors which are high growth and high priority within the South East, um, driving uh, growth and importance of the international gateways, and improving the regional connectivity, so that I guess the, the, the orbital point. We've got the A27 West Coastway line, which um, provides orbital connectivity along the southeast. But really, between the M25 and that, um, it's, it, it's, it's not, not something that there is a, that there's a huge amount of connectivity to, uh, to serve. So I guess the, the, the next steps for these um, narrative scenarios is that we, we, we do some work to quantify what the narrative actually means in terms of GVA and jobs. Um, and, and through that exercise, um, we can identify how, how growth will change um, over to 2050 
and how um, the transport network needs to support um, those different scenarios. So what comes next? So uh, we've, done, we've done these uh, topic papers which are starting to, um, to set the kind of context of the transport strategy. Currently we are um, working on the um, prioritisation of corridors, schemes and initiatives. So, for, so, so this will be done partly through um, baseline review of the key corridors, including the major road network, enhancing the, um, the evidence base and assessing and prioritising those corridors for um, further intervention. Um, this will also include development of the regional evidence base, which will support bids for um, national roads funding. Um, future demand forecasting is the, is the next stage of the scenario development work. Um, and that is um, the development of a model to quantify the impacts of these different scenarios. And then finally, on to the, uh, the five-year investment plan, um, which will look at the schemes which are currently in the pipeline and will um, prioritise those based on the, the, the strategic principles <coughs> and the vision of Transport for the South East to ensure that um, anything that's being supported and promoted <coughs> by Transport for the South East is in line with its um, vision. And then Q2, drafting the transport strategy, and then we'll move to public consultation where views from, um, from uh, all key stakeholders in the public will be invited. And then finally, the transport strategy will be published in Q4 of 2019-20. Thank you very much.